Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, my name is Victor. I work at a company called Confluent, as uh, you mentioned. So basically, I work as a, a solutions architect. And as a solutions architect, I actually have the people and the companies to, um, to work with our software. Um, as you can see right now, I'm uh, at the meetup, meaning that I don't need to my customers, so well, because our software is still is awesome, so I don't need to do this so I can fly to the Pittsburgh and uh, do the presentation. Um, so, and the reason why I'm doing this is because I also consider myself as a developer advocate that not only you know talk to the customers but also talk to developers to try to figure out like how they like our stuff, how we can improve this stuff, and uh, many other things. So yeah, before that I was I uh, was working in the company called Hazelcast, um, but right now I'm with Confluent. Um, okay. Yes. Is your mic on? Uh, it's a good point. It actually not. Now it should be on, right? Now, okay, so we skipped the all non-important part of who you are? Yes, so of course. Yes, so okay, so now we have a good, good sound. Uh, the important part, just if you have a Twitter, just go follow me. I'm a very interesting person. Right, okay. Now, um, so I was thinking like to do, right now I'm going to be doing like maybe 40, 45 minutes introduction to the whole concept, what we do in Confluent and how it's related to Java developers and other things uh, around Kafka, big data, and other interesting technologies in the in big data world. And this is how I feel myself every time when I'm talking to the people, especially the Java developers, who like focused on um, building things, not the exploring what is available is there. But it's very confusing for many people to uh, to to figure out these days like wh which, which software piece is suitable for certain other pieces of uh, their infrastructure and things like that. Now, so <laughs> basically it's a more realistic picture of the life. Yeah, so the things start as a simple, Same, by the way. yeah, exactly. So the multiple intersections, it's called the spaghetti architecture. And idea of the spaghetti architecture start with actually very, uh, very valuable and good cause, right? So you need to have uh, some application, you need to get some data from this application in the other system, for example, monitoring, for example, collecting a, uh, some uh, metrics. And you start building um, some service that this application exposes this service to, um, to another application. Uh, after a certain time, maybe other uh, applications just have the similar data, or they need to process this data, or they need to uh, do storage of this data. So you're adding more and more and more, and more uh, systems around, around your application. Now you're adding some of the big data infrastructure because obviously you had a huge success with implementing this application and the collecting this data. So now you need to have a ways how to process and get some of the information, valuable information from this data. And you're getting into the situation where um, the multiple components, as you can see, they inter interconnected and interchanged uh, with, with each other. Um, <clears throat> And also, obviously, it also increases latency and uh, uh, de the dependency between components of the system. Now, with applying uh, the concept of the pop sub or introduction of some sort of like a message bus, the um, it creates additional possibilities for uh, for scaling architecture for uh, building more robust architecture. So basically, these two slides illustrate the problem that LinkedIn uh, came up uh, from the very beginning. So for those of you who don't know, the Kafka was initially developed in the LinkedIn uh, by LinkedIn engineers to solve their problem of spaghetti architecture. When they have a obviously LinkedIn is uh, is uh, the web scale organization and they have a very big amount of data the, and the many systems actually need to get this data from, uh, from different systems. Now, so they come up with this idea, okay, so let's, uh, let's take this old concept of pops up in asynchronous communication between systems, but um, extend this with um, some of the database mentality, I would say, right? So we're adding durability uh, to the messaging system that allows to store data and um, help to you the consumers to, to consume it on their own speed, not necessarily at the time when the message arrives. So the basically, inside this uh, streaming, um, streaming pipeline, this is Apache, uh, Apache Kafka. So, so basically, uh, even though the company is the build um, like data flow systems, but essentially they, you know, they store the data. They, they build a system, a system that uh, they actually they store, store the data in it. Now, and uh, so when we have uh, uh, Apache Kafka as, um, as a heart 
of this organization that uh, that needs to like build a system that interchange the data. So this is what we what this is what we do with the Kafka in in Confluence. So we're building a not only Kafka but all, also streaming platform, uh, streaming platform that allows to organization effectively manage the data in um, in organization. Right. So um, there would be some of the details. I will I will zoom in on some of the some of the aspects, but essentially, this is how we envision um, this is how we envision the the architecture of modern um, organization. <clears throat> now, uh, I will quickly talk about I will quickly talk about three concepts of this uh, streaming platform and um, how to what's the what's the initial what's the initial idea, All right? So, how many of you guys actually used Kafka or at least heard? About Kafka, read about Kafka. Okay, so so quite quite good uh, portion to one third of audience, right? Um, uh, I'm talking about storage, how the Kafka stores the data, and uh, we're talking about a little bit of processing, like stream processing, and uh, things like that. And um, if I will have a time, I will also show you some of the code. Um, but um, but yeah, let's let's jump in. So pops up <clears throat> now. So why build why build the uh, system around the pops ab abstraction? So first of all, I already mentioned that having some medium, some of the system that lies between two components allows them uh, communicate in a synchronous fashion. Allow them communicate in the sense that they don't need to depend if one system will fail, another system will continue to run, and this uh, intermediate medium will, will will save the data. Plus, when the data arrives, another system can react immediately instead of just going there and query each and every time, um, like we do in database, for example. Um, and uh, the huge abstraction, huge portion of the software, or like all, all this like semantic that uh, we have in Kafka, built around the concept of um, transaction log, right? So idea is it's quite simple, but uh, as we will get Further, you will understand this also is quite powerful. So basically, log represents the data structure where producer will write data into the end, and the consumer will read it from the from the beginning. So, and uh, the writers, like producers or um, um, the system that generates the data, can work in a different speed than a uh, consumer that actually reads the data. Meaning that there may be some lag because of the slow consumer or fast producer, as you can see here. And uh, basically, this uh, concept allows to consumers be basically independent in the speed of producers and uh, independent from the other consumers. So the two concepts, like one basic concept if, uh, that we have on top of Kafka, it's a producer, right? So if you ever build the messaging system, you know that there's a uh, System that writes data into the queue, or reads the data to the queue, or reads data from the topic, uh, writes data to the topic. So the producer, uh, basically, the piece that actually writes data into the end of the log. Um, and the uh, consumer obviously reads data from the log. Now, the couple things that people um, might find similar to the messaging system, or uh, is that you know this it sounds very similar to messaging system topic um, queue you can uh, read message write message now there's interesting uh, concept that built in in the consumers in uh, in the Kafka it's called um, consumer groups so basically it's a difference between things that you do in traditional si systems uh, like traditional messaging system is that when you have independent consumers. So they, they receive their copy of the data, if it's topic, or if it's a queue, they have an exclusive message, one consumer will receive it. Um, but uh, how you would scale it? Like if you want to uh, increase speed of reads, so how you would do that in, um, in, in a scalable fashion? So this is kind of concept of consumer groups that lie inside the Kafka allows to do a scalable uh, consumption. So thing is that the actual log that stored your data is not only just represents one, just one file or one thing. So uh, the log is distributed uh, on uh, partitions. And uh, partitions, this is kind of um, 
um, unit of parallelization of consumption. So basically, uh, each, each broker might have multiple topics. Each topic can be separated into different partitions. And these partitions can be, separate, can be placed in the different machines. So there's a huge difference between um, messaging systems, like traditional messaging systems, where um, when you build a cluster of messaging systems, you're basically building some sort of topologies when the data can traverse from one broker to another. Here is more like um, the Kafka inherits some of the ideas of non-SQL databases, where we have consistent hashing that allows us to uh, distribute data. Uh, and uh, plus, it also allows us to create a um, the replicas of this data. So some of the brokers might have a first copy, which is called like a leader uh, replica, and in other brokers will have um, other copies, which are going to be basically replicas. And the consumer groups, consumer can be um, can be grouped in the consumer group, and they can read the data from um, same topic or multiple topics, but. Uh, each consumer can read from individual partitions. So in this case, uh, as I already mentioned, the partition becomes a scalability, um, um, scalability mean. Right? So you're using this for, for scalability reasons. So you can increase number of uh, consumer in the consumer groups that um, they will faster consume the data per partition. If you need to, if there's a, some failure of application, application um, failed, then you will see that the, oops, sorry, too fast, uh, return to consumer groups, yep, consumer groups, yep, so in this case, when the one, one of the application will fail, the, the consumer group will automatically rebalance the group and assign the consumer to new, um, to new partition, so in case of uh, failure of individual application, your uh, processing uh, will, will, will not stop. Um, so to, to simplify some of the things, like to, to make this um, the streaming platform a little bit approachable, so instead of like you writing every possible consumer for every possible system, um, the, the Apache Kafka developers came up with the idea of uh, you know, con connector architecture. So basically connectors are reusable off-the-shelf components that you can just drop in, start in, in, in um, as this individual process, and you don't need to write the code. It will automatically either, if it's a source uh, connector, that will read the data from the source and place it inside the Kafka, or if it's a sync connector that will write data into the, into the, um, into the system of, uh, of the target system. So basically, in this case, the streaming platform idea of this is to um, to replace a like traditional ETL system. So basically connectors is the way how you can do extract and load in the traditional ETL. And we're going to be talking about um, the a little bit further about how to do process, which is actual transformation part in ETL. Word. Now Using the connect framework, which is built on top of the uh, producer and consumer, which is based, it's a Java API or some other APIs for different other languages, but essentially it allows you to build a uh, pipelines of data with no or a little bit of coding. So it's pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. So because the, the connect uh, built on top of the same concepts of uh, uh, like a consumer group that provides automatic rebalance in case of failure, um, scaling out the, the consumption and uh, provide a fault tolerance management. Um, it's already kind of handled by a framework. So if you can use this component off the shelf or if it's some sort of um, very, maybe not widely spread uh, technology, uh, you can easily write this uh, connector without going into low level details of um, of uh, individual consumers. Now, uh, so this is how it works with uh, traditional systems. Like uh, we can take some some of the system can uh, write to the Kafka, collect data, for example, collecting some monitoring information, push into the Kafka, and Kafka uh, writes it down into the HDFS for the further uh, overnight uh, Hadoop jobs, for example. 
or it can be a traditional GDBC database, which uh, uh, connects to any database, fetch the data from it, and place it inside the Kafka. Also here uh, can be multiple databases, but um, there is another kind of uh, way how you can integrate with traditional GDBC. You can place it with uh, so-called CDC or change data capture uh, connector that essentially reads transactional log from database and writes it into the Kafka. And uh, uh, if you think about this, it allows to build like any possible configuration um, with all possible available co connectors that uh, already developed by many, uh, either developed by some of the open source guys, if developed by some vendors, developed some um, third parties. <laughs> There's the company, Data Maintainer, Landoop, they also develop many connectors. Um, some of the vendors, like Datastax, they develop their own connectors for, um, for Cassandra, for example, etc. Now, now, we figure out uh, the part of the, uh, the pops up thing so we can uh, get some changes from one system, have moved to, to another system. Let's talk about uh, storing the data. So, how many of you guys, like maybe you heard about this, but uh, New York Times recently published an uh, article in our blog, in Confluent Blog, about how they use Kafka to do, you know, storage all their articles inside the Kafka, right? So it's not only messaging system anymore, but they use the Kafka as essentially a database, right? So with the concept of a, a compacted log, okay, so before I go into this one. So the log itself will capture all possible, uh, all possible messages that you put inside this, um, inside this topic. And uh, there is a retention policy that allows you to store for a particular period of time. And uh, usually this retention period, uh, the, the default retention period is seven days, but you can have it for, you know, for integer max value, basically. Um, in this case, you have really, 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 really big uh, topic with data for all period of time. However, if you don't need to do this, there is also a possibility to store this data only latest and greatest pieces of this data. So um, data in, uh, in a Kafka topic stored by basically key value. Um, there is no is essential uh, need for key in the Kafka because Kafka don't care. It just saves data in the, in the binary format. It stores data in the binary format. But key is responsible for, for um, uh, for navigation, how the data will be, on what, which topic will be uh, this data end up. Now, compact to topic, it actually stores the latest value for a particular key. So in this case, it always will have latest uh, result of uh, every possible message. The difference, again, between regular topic, you have everything, full story of this particular message based on the key compacted topic, you have only latest and greatest, which is, looks like a traditional key value storage, right? You do have a similar concept. This is a key value data. You can read this. Um, and uh, why I'm talking about this is that the story, store, st storage story in uh, Kafka is, is quite strong. So it's b basically... If you think about this, it's a system that has the messaging capabilities plus durability of database. Now, the uh, ordering is guaranteed based on partition. So if you're putting the data for a particular key, this data will end up on the single partition, and this data would be ordered. Um, in this case, for example, if you're talking about some uh, user account information, account ID will be uh, define how the data will be placed in partition, all events for this particular account will be stored in ordered fashion. Um, yeah. Uh, so, in, in that case, I didn't, I didn't write to read that article, but like the New York Times article, but is, is it a historical reference of everything they're sending, or is it kind of, you know, the like, last couple of days? Because I think the one, the one thing that's interesting, and I've been working with Topic part of the time, um, is that you know, you're, you're, you're treating yourself by an offset, right? This is, it's not really like, it, there's no content introspection, the 
there's no filter capability. You're really indexing like a traditional data store would have. So if, if you say you do that for 10 years, right, and, and you send a million messages a day over 10 years, mm -hmm. how do I find like the message from Mike Marzo from like nine years ago that was sent in March? It, it, it doesn't feel like a good pattern. It feels like an anti-pattern. Mm -hmm. If you want to do that, I think, and I think the connector infrastructure gives you a great way to do that by kind of offloading it into a you know a storm or a Hadoop. Right, where, where you can kind of do more intelligible ad hoc querying for data. Mm -hmm. I, like the replay stuff is really strong, but I, I feel like that use case is something that's much more temporally advantageous in the near term as opposed mm -hmm. to over time. Yeah, so basically let me repeat your question. So question is like, what is uh, like a querying story here, right? How we can uh, read the data from, uh, from the far and past. So you already mentioned that um, so actually, your answer is in your question when you mentioned other systems like Hadoop and Spark and Storm that you use to process this data. You can do the same thing with Kafka Streams, which is, I will touch base a little bit, so this is a specific framework that will allow you to do like stream processing. And the Kafka Stream actually simplifies many things in related to um, how to deal with the filtering, how to do with mailing, the data augmentation and uh, enrichment and all the kind of things. And it also allows you to you know, save it in the additional topic, which is basically, so New York Times is doing this, they're not saving everything. They have uh, all published materials in a compact topic, meaning that they don't uh, capture all changes that happened with this particular article, but they have uh, published materials that stored in Kafka, so they can, um, can build uh, using Kafka Streams can build like different views for it, for this data based on the Kafka Streams API. But I will, I think I do have some slides about the Kafka Streams okay. as well. But in general, the um, having the framework like the Kafka Streams help you. Yeah, I do have I do have slides, so I will uh, get back to this one in processing. Yep. Um, obviously, like everything that you expect from distributed system, including a uh, replication, including a uh, um, elastic scalability and the fault tolerance, it's already present there. Um, there is a inside intercluster replication that allows you to have a um, backup copies or replicas of the data in another node. There is a multi, uh, multi cluster replication as well. Now let's talk about process. So, actually, um, uh, first generation of the processing data was obviously Hadoop. Uh, Hadoop provided a breakthrough in uh, mentality, basically, how we need to deal with distributed processing, how we dealing with the big uh, amounts of data, and how the, first of all, data would be stored in the um, distributed reliable fashion. Uh, but now uh, we're getting into world wave um, uh, processing of the streams data that come from, um, from event stream of uh, microservices interchange. So, a little bit about Kafka Streams. So this is most important, I guess, more important thing for Java developers because it's a very, uh, very cool API in terms of building the application without like going into this like weird world on the very beginning of my first slide when this uh, um, Charlie from uh, it's always sunny Philadelphia trying to find this guy who delivered the message. Now. Kafka Streams. So first of all, it's a part of the uh, it's a part of the Apache Kafka. So Kafka Streams is a Java library. So it is not a cluster system. It's not uh, it's not a distributed computation thing like you do with the Spark or you do with Storm or you do with Flink, for example. Um, it's very lightweight. You can be uh, not opinionated in terms of like how you deploy your application. So you will stay in the in the in the way that you know traditional way of deploying application. If you like your WAR files, you can deploy Kafka Streams application as a part of the WAR file. If you like your um, fat jars, you can also do in this. Um, and it's actual real, uh, real streaming system, meaning that it's not micro batch. It's uh, per event or per um, per message. So it's not. It doesn't like accumulate some of the uh, some of the data, and after that, it runs this uh, the like a batch dog on top of on top of this it's actually processed per message um, <laughs> some of the some of the traditional operation that you can do it's the, the mapping which is you can do some modification of the data you can do filtering um, 
you can do uh, some aggregates, you can join multiple topics, multiple streams in, uh, in this sense. So, and this is like a slide that explains, uh, um, explains multiple um, <laughs> uh, components very well. So, typical scenario, um, and uh, who can tell me like what kind of, like there's a special name for this kind of architecture of data processing, who knows this? Yes, it's Lambda architecture. So Lambda architecture has a two, uh, two point. It's a batch layer. In the, our case, it's a Hadoop layer. And there's a stream processing layer. So the idea of Lambda architecture was essentially from how to, how to build the data processing system that's tolerable to, to failures, to human failures, and uh, provides kind of balance between speed and uh, accurate results. So that's why like, Hadoop uh, known as a system that allows you to get pretty accurate result if it's, you know, runs smoothly overnight and your data already here. So everything that you need to process is already arrived. So end of the day, you run your Hadoop job. Next morning, you have a result, you have a report. Now, if you need to have, if you need to have more you know, ballpark result without going into very much details. You can use the streaming system that will operate on the batches or micro, uh, like uh, smaller batches of the data that arrive over time, like every hour. You can uh, run this uh, stream processing system. And after that, these um, servant views on the, very, um, on the very bottom, these guys, um, they would be merged in the very beginning uh, and the very end of this, of this processing will be displayed um, for a user consumption. So basically, this is a um, very traditional system that was like available since, I guess, Rise of the Storm, uh, because the Lambda architecture was proposed by one of the creators of Storm uh, from Twitter. Now, so a couple components here. <laughs> um, we do have a Hadoop cluster. We do have a cluster of our stream processing. We need to have extra, some, some of the storage that uh, allows us to store intermediate result or this uh, so-called uh, pre-compiled pre view based on the time. And uh, still, it serves the purpose, but it still created additional complexity and uh, additional, you know, it's, it's, it's still, uh, it has uh, lots of moving parts. Now, what is proposed by, you know, by implementing Kafka streams is drastically simplifying this uh, concept. So basically, I guess it's called like a cop architecture, right? So it's, uh, the, the, the batch layer is not in the, in the play anymore. So the way how it works, you're writing your application. So as a developer, as a Java developer, you're writing your Java code. You're not writing your cluster code. And you always know where your... Um, where your code is running because the Kafka streams uh, application runs in the concept of your in the context of your application. So, how many of you guys wrote like uh, Spark jobs, like at least like once and two? Okay, so we have a couple of people. So basically, in the Spark, um, in Spark architecture, you uh, from your application you're actually submitting job into the cluster um, that this stuff will be executed there. So it also sometimes creates um, I would say like a, when leaking abstraction, when, when the abstraction that responsible for dealing with, responsible for dealing with the um, job execution or configuration of the job, leaking into the business logic. And when you look into your code, you not every time know where this code is executing. Is it executing on the cluster or it will be executing on the actual driver that you know, starts this application. So with the Kafka streams, you always know that you're running this um, in the context of uh, your application. And why to use some external storage where you have a Kafka that can provide you um, database like uh, durability guarantees? So basically, Kafka allows to store the intermediate results. So that's why the um, Kafka stream application will talk to Kafka constantly. So for example, it can read the data, underlying consumer will be um, responsible for, for reading the data, and underlying producer will be responsible for writing the data. Plus, the 
it's provides abstraction on top of the um, <coughs> on top of the topic that you can have uh, stream, or if you need to have abstraction similar to table, where you don't need to have all the results from from the past, you just need to have a latest result. So you have abstraction as a k table basically. Now um, and uh, yeah, like I mentioned, the Kafka streams provide kind of unification between um, um, tables and streams. So we, we, the difference between streams when you and table when you have every message versus when you have a view of the system over the time. Um, the Kafka streams has um, coverage for both use cases. Like if you need to have a, like a tabular like uh, um, data or it's like more stream-like stream data. Um, so the, the, uh, there are many examples that uh, where you can use these uh, Kafka streams. Like I said, it's just a library, um, and uh, many uh, use cases can be covered by just you know applying this. Even even like our own product that we use for um, that we develop for monitoring and uh, observing the health of a cluster, uh, Kafka cluster uses Kafka streams to um, to run this, uh, you know, information about monitoring what's the overall throughput, what's the overall latency, etc. So, uh, Confluent Control Center uses uh, it's also like a Kafka stream application. Um, now, now it's full picture. Now it's full picture, and uh, if you um, if you familiar with the concept of ETL, you can find this also very familiar. So basically, in ETL world, as I already mentioned at the very beginning. We have extract and load. So we're reading data from the source and we're writing data to, this, uh, to the target. So in this case, uh, Kafka Connect provides us these two components. And if you need to do processing, the, you run this like a transform thing. You run this with Kafka Stream. Now, and uh, everything is built around the Kafka platform itself, right? So basically, this is a full picture. This is what we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to. Um, to deliver, and this is what we're trying to help organizations to um, to build this. Now, with this uh, full picture, we can have full-blown a um, streaming platform. Um, so, I think I think I will just talk a little quick about what's the difference between um, the Confluent open source and the uh, Apache Kafka. Yeah. Yes, it's a very good question. So, the story with Hazelcast, it's very interesting. <laughs> so, um, there is a, uh, as I already mentioned, there is a, the company, they do in open source connectors called uh, Data Mountaineer or Landup. They have a weird relationship. I don't know which one is belong to each other. So, they, they, they develop a lot of connectors. Um, so, they, uh, they also develop like Hazelcast connector as well. So there is a connector that allows you to dump data into into the Hazelcast. So essentially, um, it is very good. It's a very good. Um, it's a very good blog post that I probably need to write. How you can build some sort of like a hot cache system based on CDC connector. So essentially, the, the thing what uh, Mike is asking. So idea is um, for Hazelcast is that Hazelcast can sit on top of database and provide you seamless. Um, uh, caching capabilities for uh, for your application, uh, meaning that um, Hazelcast can be uh, your read through cache. So if you need some read some data that are not in the cache, your application logic not needs to do this. So Hazelcast know how to go to database and read this data. However, the 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 alternative feedback is not available because Hazelcast cannot be notified from database. Uh, based on the changes that happen database. So, so what happened uh, right now? There are um, uh, integration with some third-party tool uh, called Stream that allows to read the changes that the capture events and update the cache. Now, for for Kafka, it's actually a very good uh, use case that allows to build like a hot cache pop pipeline because CDC connector is available. It will get a stream of events from uh, from database send it to the Kafka and after that update the cache based on the information. So yeah, this is very good use case and I probably just need to sit down and uh, write this. 
a um, couple, uh, couple things. So first of all, like, uh, there is Apache Kafka. You can go to Apache, uh, the Kafka .apache .org, um and uh, download it from there. So no problem here. Um, it also includes uh, Kafka Stream, because Kafka Stream is a library, and also includes a connector framework. Now, on top of uh, open source Apache Kafka, we at Confluent, we built um, um, some of the connectors that we built. And uh, this we call like, certified connectors. So we know that the quality of these uh, connectors, we know how to, or you know, either we support them because we develop them, or we can say that we will take care of this by supporting this. Now, w when we talk about the all this like data flow, um, I haven't I haven't talked about a scheme of the data. So. Uh, Many of you probably heard that, like when you're dumping so, something to uh, to HDFS, um, HDFS is good for unstructured data, but how to deal with this in an application where we need to deal with data, with the need to with deal with structure. Now, so we we also developed a thing called the scheme registry that allows to um, to register a schema of your data. Again, Kafka stores just the binary. Kafka don't care about schema, but your application does. Now, the way how it works right now with schema registry, you ring this pipe load. There's a special type of serializer that will read this pipe, uh, payload from the Kafka and saying, hey, I see there is a schema ID, meaning that I know how to fetch it from external resource to, and uh, to turn it into actual Java object. So in this case, um, the schema registry, this is a system that provide some like API, essentially REST. And also schema registry also use Kafka as a storage. So basically schemas also stored in the, in the, in the Kafka. So the serializer will call schema registry and fetch the schema from the Kafka and turn it into actual object. So it helps um, in a larger scale when your organization or your department or your microservice depends on some of the data that another um, organization or another uh, department or another service provide, but uh, you don't want to tie them in terms of like a schema, so you can um, that organization can publish schema and you can read the schema um, from from schema registry. Now, in the time like a long time ago, a couple of years ago, when there were no such a rich infrastructure of uh, Kafka clients available, schema. Um, uh, sorry, the REST, uh, REST proxy was quite popular. So basically, the REST proxy allows to read and write through Kafka, to or in from Kafka uh, using just REST interface. Like if you need to deal with uh, Kafka through curl, for example, uh, you can call it through the REST. Um, so and uh, it's also open source piece and um, is built built on top of like 100% Kafka Apache Kafka. We're not doing any augmentation there. Plus, we're providing some of the tools for, for development. We have this uh, Confluent uh, command line tool that allow you to, you know, start your cluster, start all the components from the command line instead of just doing. Um, you need to know like how to start the Kafka. Before before that, you need to start Zookeeper. After that, uh, you need to use the, if you need to use schema registry, schema registry, you need to make sure that Kafka is up and running, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this tool is actually helps uh, to manage this. And on top of the Confluent open source, again, it's a to licensed, uh, open source, free, no charge, etc. Uh, but on top of this, we uh, built uh, the Confluent Enterprise. Which is um, provide some of the enterprise grade um, uh, tools like monitoring, which is a confluent control center, a multi data center replication. So with the multi data center replication, there is also interesting story. There is a open source uh, plugin called Mirror Maker. Um, it's 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 there. It's free. It's also uh, based on Apache Kafka. But we build a a replicat a replicator. Uh, so replicator uh, is uh, far superior in terms of feature, in terms of flexibility, in terms of ease of use, uh, than uh, Mirror Maker. Also, as far as I know, there's another one that um, called Y Replicator. It's, um, it's something that Uber um, developed and they released. Um, I know, I guess, only one company who use uh, this Y Replicator instead of uh, Mirror Maker or um, replicator from Confluent. Um, yeah, and there is also 
tool called uh, Auto Auto uh, Rebalancer that allow you to, if you're running um, Kafka cluster for a long time and you do lots of changes in uh, in the real time, you're changing the uh, creating topics, creating the partitions. Sometimes cluster can be um, out of balance in terms of how the data would be distributed. Um, some of the broker nodes would be um, oversaturated, some of them undersaturated. So in this case, the auto uh, data rebalancer allow you to you know make it make it more or less even. Now, so this is this is how it looks like. Um, so a couple things that I can leave you from here. So you can grab a couple books from our website. Uh, those books are for free. So basically, this book is only one Kafka book that you ever need. So this is a definitive guide uh, uh, written by um, Gwen Neha and uh, Todd Palanino. He's, uh, he's from LinkedIn. Gwen and Neha hey, from, from Confluent. Neha was the, um, one of the founders of Kafka from the LinkedIn. Uh, there's a book from Jay. Um, and uh, this is a uh, this is very good the book making sense of stream processing uh, in terms of like uh, wrapping your head head around um, about how to change the view to the data. If you ever seen the presentation called Turning Database Outside Inside Out by Martin Kleppman, so it's um, the it's inspired uh, many many systems how to turn how to change the view to your data. And uh, the making sense of stream processing is also very good, um, a very good read about this one. Now, this is, uh, this is I'm done with my presentation and I, I did this in the 45 minutes, as I promised. Now, I'll take some questions. Um, also, I will stay here. We're gonna be doing another cool part. So I see Baruch almost not, not amused by so it's time for him to, to no, join no, me on the stage. Okay, so, um, if you want, I can show you some code. If not, uh, I can uh, answer some questions. Or I can do both. Or I can do both in the, in the same time. Insane. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of code, so let me show you a, in the presentation mode. Presentation mode. Uh, boom, 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 boom. So I will go and show you, hello producer. Now, oops, sorry, it's a solution. So um, basically this is, this is how your application that will interact with Kafka looks like. So if you need to write something to the Kafka, so first of all, you need to provide a um, the address of the server. In this case, it's gonna be some, some broker, default port. Um, and pretty much it. Uh, the serialization part is is uh, is more like Java related or like your application logic related thing. Now we're creating a uh, instance of a producer by calling uh, new uh, Kafka producer and passing here a properties. Um, and the reason why we need to specify serializers is that um, in our case, I'm producing a record that will contain key as a string and uh, the string is a value. So this is how I basically write something into the Kafka. I'm creating this uh, producer record and, uh, and how I send it to, to the Kafka. So this is, this is pretty much it, so that's it. So there, you don't need to use any like GNDI lookup uh, as you do with the JMS, for example. Uh, it, it is it is quite simple. Uh, consumer on the other side is also it's also very uh, very simple. Um, now I need to first of all I need to connect to um, to some server. Uh, also I need to know how to deserialize. So I, this is why I'm providing the key and value deserializer for a particular consumer. Now and remember when I was talking about the consumer group. So when you start multiple instances of the consumer that will they they, they join the uh, consumer group. Uh, for, um, for scalability, if you have a large number of messages that come from the producer, you can um, speed up the load or speed up processing by uh, adding more consumers in the consumer groups. Is how I specify consumer group. Um, I didn't talk. Uh, I didn't talk about offset much, but the offsets is actually a very important uh, concept inside the Kafka. So, 
each and every time when the consumer um, consumer reads the particular message, it needs to tell uh, either cons next consumer, in the consumer group, or needs to tell himself in the in the future where it stopped. So this is why when we uh, when we reading message from the from the particular topic, we need to know uh, where we stopped last time. So uh, this is why we're using these offsets. Uh, offset defines the way, like what kind of message uh, was uh, consumed before. And um, in this case, like I'm, I'm putting this auto commit uh, of of um, of offsets. So for example, imagine we have a consumer that reads the data. We read the data with uh, offset zero offset one, offset two, and after that we failed. Now, meaning that the next time when we restart the processing, we will continue from the second one because uh, during the consumption of the second one, we didn't send a um, um, offset commit command. So in this case, uh, we, we, we assume that, okay, so this is a place where we start. Also, we can always reply. Um, so in this case, there is a, a config allow me to Oh, every time when I start this consumer, I will start reading from the very beginning. So in some cases, I need to do this to reprocess all messages. But sometimes I don't need to do this. So in this case, I would just sit there and will uh, read the messages with um, latest, uh, latest offset. So this is pretty much it. So Java API is quite straightforward and easy to use. But it's still, um, that nothing here about processing. It's just, you know, reading data, writing data. Um, so the actual part when we need to do processing, it comes into the Kafka streams. So let me demonstrate you real quick. Um, yep. So the way how it looks like, so my Kafka stream application looks like this. Um, and the very big, also I mentioned and the, that the Kafka Streams application, it's you know, just a Java application. Kafka Streams is just a library. So everything that runs here runs in the context of Java process. So there is no cluster and, and there is no um, some, some external system that will execute our code. So similar to the, similar to the consumer and producer, I need to specify URL to connect because application, um, application ID essentially will create a um, consumer group for, uh, for this consumer because um, Kafka stream applications can be, you know, you can scale out by starting multiple instances of Kafka stream application that will uh, perform this uh, uh, stream processing in parallel. Now, for Java developers, um, this is something that you might, especially like Java 8 guys, how many of you guys are using Java 8 already? It's been a while, three years, right? Since Java 9. We will. We we're going to talk about Java 9 today. Now, so this piece looks very familiar to you from the Java Util stream, right? So you have a, you, you know, the map filter, uh, some other operations like a flat map, etc. So you can do the same things, but imagine this is actual real stream. When we're dealing with, uh, with Java Util stream, essentially, it's not stream processing because you do this stream process operation on the collection, and this collection is is already um, already there, right? So we will have some puzzles that we will dealing with uh, modification of collection when we do stream processing, and uh, you will tell us um, how it looks like. But here, this actual real stream processing because we're creating the stream from the topic, and the data in the topic will arrive, you know, as as soon as the new data will arrive. Every message will be placed through this pipeline of operation. In this case, it's a flat map. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, flat map of values. So I want to want to split the entries from the file, which are going to be sentences from the book. Um, I want to do uh, to lowercase. In this case, I do map values. So I will produce another stream that will contains a entry with a lowercase um, lowercase value. I want to clean up the words, remove some nonsense, remove some uh, uh, numbers, for example, just make sure that it's just words. And now I want to remove from the another stream. So each operation will create the abstract stream um, the, um, of the data. Um, 
And after that, I'll do transformation of the key. I'm changing the key of the, this operation. Uh, and I'll run grouping and aggregation. Now, so all this will create a key table. This will create a um, some abstract table, but we need to actually write this result somewhere. So we're using this method uh, two that will actually write a result of this transformation from key table, um, which is Java Java thing, into the actual compacted topic inside the Kafka. So, and when we uh, when I did this Kafka stream start, this code will be executed constantly for each and every message that arrives. Um, I think it's quite elegant in terms of how it looks in, uh, from perspective of reading code, even though if you find there's some methods that are not, not suitable or you need to extend this at some point, uh, there are ways, there are different API, but I'm not going to talk about this today. Um, so this API called the processor API. So yeah, this is Kafka streams. So it's, it's quite a uh, quite elegant way to, uh, to process data in and out of Kafka. And if you don't have any questions, probably I will have if you want to talk after. Um, Mike, you wanted to, uh, to make some announcement? Because I'm pretty done with my con content. We're going to be switching your laptop so you can uh, talk. Um, I'm not leaving here, so um, hold on your applause.